So that, for example, when I thought that we should try to make this Fortran system, uh, I simply wrote a letter to my boss at the time, Cuthbert Hurd, and uh, suggested that we do that. And he said, fine, we'll do it. In August of 1952, the engineering model of the defense calculator, na later named the 701, was running. And I think we had six orders. And we invited the representative of each of the companies who had ordered the machine to come to Poughkeepsie for a week. And we each got a shot on his computer. He writes his program, and going to bam, got the result. And we all sat there and said, how in the world are we going to keep these machines busy? It's so tremendously fast. How can we do that? The, the Fortran team, of course, was put together uh, gradually as, as the problem got larger and larger uh, that we had to deal with. Uh, it began with Irv Ziller and myself. Our primary objective or focus was to permit people to concentrate on the essence of their problems and eliminate preoccupation with the mechanics of the computer per se. Very shortly after that, Harlan Herrick joined us. I said, John, back us. <laughs> we can't simulate a human programmer. You're taking this language and using this language to put a problem and, and, and getting a, an object code from the 704 that would even approach the efficiency of a human programmer. Like me, for example, I'm a great programmer, you know. And then we hired Bob Nelson. I came to work for John Backus. And the first day that the Fortran group met were four of us on that day and I actually was hired as a technical typist and eventually became uh, one of our best technical people then we gradually acquired uh, people some people from outside of IBM Sheldon Best from MIT uh, almost everyone was there already but when I came it was uh, John Backus and Harlan Herrick Irv Ziller and Bob Nelson I think came uh, about the same time that I did, or maybe a little afterwards, I can't remember exactly. And Roy Nutt from United Aircraft, who gave a lot of his time to us. We responded right away, and I uh, shortly afterwards took a trip down to New York to talk to him. And shortly after that, Peter Sheridan joined us. Yeah, I, was, I was tickled pink when John uh, uh, decided to take me aboard. Dave Sayer joined about that time, too. I joined IBM in 1955. And I joined as a mathematician. Uh, Lois Hyped came. It's just after I graduated from college as a math major, but knew nothing about computers, except they existed. Dick Goldberg, a, a mathematician who joined us about midway. Well, it was, it was very exciting. It was not, it was out, completely outside of my experience. I mean, I had been in academic life, I mean, uh, before that, and I never had done that kind of uh, uh, kind of crash thing. But there was a, uh, you know, like all things that are out of the ordinary. I mean, there was a lot of uh, excitement. I mean, but these were very unusual people. Some of them were extremely unusual, and it was it was a kind of a almost like a a matter of fate that they came to join us because they had certain abilities that if without them we probably would never have been able to do what we did. And in the background was the the skepticism, uh, the entrenchment of many of the people who did programming in this uh, in this way at that time, what was called hand-to-hand -hand combat with the machine. So we had to discover all the technology uh, that we needed uh, ourselves. 
we would come to work, there was an elevator that worked very slowly. And uh, as soon as uh, Irv and I, or Peter and I, got on the elevator, the elevator man, Lou, would look at us and says, Oh, there they are. Bring them in in the white coat. The white coats, you know. As though he, you know he, we, we were sort of irregular IBMers. <laughs> <laughs> we lived in a room uh, where we all had desks, no dividers. And the uh, desks were butted up against one another. Uh, it was a quaint little place, very pleasant. We were all in each other's pockets. We worked as a kind of uh, small family. We were in completely uncharted uh, waters. We were trying to do something that uh, basically nobody had ever tried to do before and nobody had ever succeeded in doing. But none of this theory existed. Nothing was known about parsing. It was all invented at the time, and it wasn't a case of choosing between this method and that method and this theory and that theory. There were no theories. You were engaging in something that was uh, not, a, not an everyday activity, something that was not, not a humdrum thing. It, it was an act of faith. There were no, no benchmarks to compare the work to. There, there was only the, you know, the group of us working together and seeing what each other was doing and having uh, uh, faith in ourselves. Occasionally, people did ask us how long it was going to when, when are you guys going to be done? Uh, and we would always say, uh, six months. <laughs> Come back in six months. We, we honestly felt all the time that we were going to be done six months from now, but it turned out to be three years. <laughs> John was uh, uh, really more of a, a leader of that uh, effort than, uh, than he cares to admit. You know, we, we spent a lot of time talking together and perhaps that, uh, you know, helped to motivate us all. In some way that I, I don't know, he managed to keep a, a little pool of silence that the group could work in for long enough to, to carry out what it needed to do. What kept us going, uh, I think, was the, uh, the challenge of the problems, the... Uh, the feeling that, that we were going to succeed and the feeling that uh, what we would succeed in doing was more than completing a project but doing something that would fundamentally advance the state of the art. Little by little it, it didn't make mistakes and then when it stopped making mistakes or almost stopped making mistakes then we could finally issue Fortran. Fortran, it sounds like something spelled backwards. We would continuously invent uh, very trite names for the system and, and I would come in with the, the today's name and try it out on my friends and they would all say oh god Bacchus no not that and one day he came in and he says I've got it formula translation Fortran and I went Ugh. <laughs> but, but it was the only thing we had so Fortran it became the people I have known who have made great innovations, from Lyman, Nobel Prize winners I've known, others, John Backus, <clears throat> they have to be able to think tops down and bottoms up. There are very few people like that. Perhaps uh, the, the most important characteristic for scientific innovation is a, uh, a freedom of association, the ability to interrelate what perhaps for most minds would appear to be totally disparate and unrelated, uh, a leap of connectivity, a leap of logic. Uh. To ask a new question that hasn't been asked before, that, that uh, brings out an aspect of the subject that uh, is, is unnoticed. A lack of inhibition. Uh, and, and an ability to throw out the feelings that you can't do it and let yourself really become free inside. I don't know, people are very different. I myself, you know, so I'm very slow and like to go very deeply and in a great detail into things. I mean, the, so that takes persistence and patience and the willingness to fail all the time. That you constantly try, you have to generate many ideas and then work very hard 
only to discover that they don't work. <laughs> and, and you keep doing that over and over again and, until finally you, you find one that does work. If you really are working in a new area, where do you think it helps um, if you are something of a science fiction writer? Uh, uh, you, because you have to construct scenarios about how to get from here to there, where there is some place no one has ever been before. We just thought of it as, as something that would make programming the 704 very much less expensive and, and very much easier and more accessible, but uh, we didn't... Uh, we didn't have the slightest idea that it was going to cause such a, a stir as it, as it finally did. Well, I think it was a, a very well thought out thing. It's, it's simple and it's elegant. And uh, it's quite, I think, quite natural. Uh, it's a language that is very easy to learn. Well, it's also adapted. I mean, it's changed. It's still a very good big language for programming scientific programs in. I mean, the, the, uh, the notation is really quite close to what, you know, what mathematicians and scientists use. And furthermore, it produces good, good programs. I mean, uh, I, I, I certainly could never have foreseen how it would have affected my life, but it has affected my life now uh, very deeply. First of all, I'm thankful and, and, uh, and proud. Of course, we'd all be uh, crazy if we weren't proud of it. It's not everybody that starts out their working life with such a, you know, absolutely marvelous project. The really remarkable achievement that my friends made in, in producing the compiler is not well understood by the computer world in general. They set out to produce a compiler that would produce the most optimized programs possible. And they did this in such a superlative way by a remarkable group effort that this compiler produced the most optimized programs for the next 20 years. And when you compare that with other technological efforts, what other computer has ever survived for more than five years? What program uh, stands as the best program for more than two or three years? Uh, you know, they, one can no, hardly think of any technological effort that, that stands as, as the best work in its field for more than, more than a few years, and this one stood for 20.